So, um, yeah, I'm Adrian. I'm uh, working at Arizona State University with uh, Phil Mouskoff. And, yeah, and I'll explain um, why we are using the RF SOC. And um, also, I'm going to add a lot of information about a project that I've been working on called BLAST TNG. Okay. So, um, yeah, BLAST TNG. So, um, I'm part of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and we're doing cosmology as well as um, far infrared astronomy. And just to um, sort of motivate the, the use of the RF SOC, um, so this is a picture of the Eagle Nebula and optical. And um, you can see that a lot of the light is extincted by this gas or smoke. And if we look at, and, and apparently there's supposed to be stars forming in these, in these regions. And if we want to actually study that, we want to be able to peer into the clouds. And here's that same um, region of the sky, but in far infrared, imaged by Herschel. And um, you can tell the difference between the two. If we overlap them, you can see that um, the gas and smoke is actually, the dust is bright in far infrared. And so you can actually uh, measure the properties of the dust and gas and also the uh, magnetic field um, uh, direction, uh, which, uh, which the dust will align or um, align uh, orthogonal or parallel to. Um, and the light that's e emitted from uh, these dust grains will actually become polarized, and that um, alignment of the polarization of the light will tell you the direction of the magnetic field in that region. Um, so BLAST's science goal is to actually understand the role that magnetic fields play. And so in order to actually measure far infrared um, radiation, um, what we're doing is using these superconducting resonators, uh, which use a property called the kinetic inductance, which all metals have, but at low temperatures, it becomes a very serious component to the total inductance. And the top right here, we have uh, the three different bands, uh, the three different focal planes that we're using in BLAST, and we have 250, 350, and 500 microns. And if you zoom in on one of the uh, pixels, and a pixel is actually two detectors, and we have uh, uh, two polarizations, and then the resonator is an inductive element, and then an interdigital capacitor, and then we have a coupling capacitor to couple to a microwave feed line. And so each detector has its own resonant frequency, and we multiplex them all to one, uh, one feed line. And uh, if you want to learn more about, read out, uh, see Jenny's talk. Okay, and another uh, submillimeter detector, uh, which uh, we, it's kind of a competitor to kinetic inductance detectors. Um, so frequency multiplex DESs, so transition edge sensors. Um, they have coupled them to squids and then inductively coupled them to superconducting resonators, and then you can multiplex them in the same way. So if you're designing a readout system for MKIDS, maybe slight modification it could be used for mu mux to ES as well. And yeah, see Mitch talk about the Smurf readout. And uh, another detector, this is not a submillimeter detector, but this is something that I'm excited about, which doesn't have funding. So I work on the, my free time. But um, I took an, an LNA box and some superconducting nanowire uh, single photon detectors and used a bunch of uh, low noise amplifier, like surface mount components um, from Hamdi Manny. Um, and we ended up actually making a multiplexed array of these. And they're uh, really fun detectors to use, and hopefully we can use them for um, intensity uniformity. Okay, so some of the device physics. So, yeah, so kinetic inductance. So it's actually um, a serious effect at these low temperatures in, in a superconductor. And the inductance is actually you know, inversely proportional to the number of Cooper pairs. And as you shine light on the detector, you're changing the number of Cooper pairs. You're breaking them apart. You're creating quasi-particles. And that changes this inductance. And it changes the resonant frequency, which is the sum of the geometric inductance and also the kinetic. Um, and then you can find how this changes, um, uh, this inductance changes with respect to absorbed power. And here's just a simulation on the right of what the shift in resonant frequency would, you would have for a particular power absorbed. So all you would have to do in order to read this out 
and to measure the amount of power is you would place um, a tone at the resonant frequency. And if the if power is absorbed in the detector and you are measuring the power of this tone at the end of the of of the device, then you'll get a difference in the amount of power transmitted through the circuit if it shifts. Okay. So then you just write a tone for every detector, and you just observe the differences in the tone powers or the phase of this microwave signal. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, building upon the open source uh, work from UCSB, from the Archons uh, project, uh, we modified some of their firmware, ended up design, redesigning a lot of it, but it was a good start and we learned a lot from it, so that was a great use of password. Um, and so this is the sort of block diagram of our readout. So we have our um, frequency comb stored in a QDR, a quad data rate memory, and we play that out of the DAC. And then it goes through the detectors, the detectors become modulated by the sky, and then we can detect that modulation by this demodulation path. So this is a polyphase filter bank, the combination of these two. Um, we have a buffer for bin selection. Sometimes detectors land in the same FFT bin. So we buffer them up so we can recall that same bin again. We do a complex multiply to convert some of the tones which are off of the bin center. So we could do coherent averaging of, uh, of the in-phase and quadrature components that come out of the FFT. Um, so we, we basically, um, because we already know what tone we're sending out, we can predict the exact offset of, from the bin center and we down convert each tone to the center of the bin so that we can coherently average. And then we packetize it and then send it out in 1GB port as UDP packets. And so uh, this firmware is also open source and we provide it to a number of groups, uh, SuperSec, Muscat, Toltec, CCAP Prime, and Olympo. Okay. So, yeah, if you have a bunch of roaches and you put them in a stack, it's obviously got to be called the Roach Motel. <laughs> this, and so this is um, a sort of a victory shot after um, passing the, um, uh, the thermal vacuum test in Palestine, Texas at the Columbia Scientific Ballooning Facility. Um, and then this is on the right in Antarctica. I just wanted to show this with the lid off of the top roach. We have a bunch of things crammed in there. We have all of our IF components up here, filters like mixers, programmable attenuators, and then heat pipes. So we have heat pipes strapped onto the Vertex 6, um, which is attached to the side rails of this, of the motel. Um, and another, another copper braid here. Okay. Um, and yeah, so while we were in Texas, here's um, Here's uh, the PI, uh, Mark Devlin actually using a calibrated black body source, uh, soldering iron, <laughs> to, to check if our detectors will see far infrared, and they did, so that was great. Um, and then here's uh, Sam and I, um, who's recently graduated and has a job actually not far from here. It's like a spin-off of Lincoln Labs. Um, so this was, yeah, July, so as we were in Texas, uh, this article comes up, and Okay, let me Google Translate this. So, Olympo has launched into the atmosphere and will photograph the universe after the Big Bang. And this is the 14th of July. So, as we were there, we we're excited. We're like, we're going to be the first uh, Roach twos in near space, and also the first kinetic inductance detectors. The Italians did it, <laughs> but that's okay because we provided the firmware and the the readout board. So we were excited about this. Some of the rest, some of the team were were a little bummed, but. We're still excited. But anyway, so we kept on. So we passed compatibility in Texas, and then we went down to Antarctica. Um, and so we had to build up the gondola again, put on a bunch of mylar, and uh, we fit it in the high bay. It's a very big gondola. It's uh, like 6,000 pounds. And uh, here is right at the long duration balloon facility. So we have the gondola lift up here. And this was actually a launch attempt and unfortunately, we were third in line uh, this season, or last season. And so um, the weather starts to uh, deteriorate towards the end of the season, and you end up losing um, the uh, polar vortex, which you would like to launch your balloon, and then it will take you around the pole, and then you can cut it down right about where you took off. 
So that starts to break up, and uh, we would have had the chance or could have the potential of going out over the sea and then have a non-recoverable uh, system. So uh, we ended up actually not being able to launch. We tried four times, and the wind was uh, too high. The wind has to be under five knots. Um, and once they take this gigantic balloon out of the box, it's, you can't put it back in. So, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, we, we didn't get to. So we packed it up, um, and we put it into the high bay, and uh, it's now spending the winter. It, it, it's down there right now, um, but we'll be first in line this year. So I'm going back down. And um, so, yeah, so we, now I've come back, and I've had this whole summer to do stuff, and so now I'm thinking about other projects, and of course my advisors put me on a bunch more. And so now um, we learned about this coming along, so the RF SOC. And this is really exciting because um, if we calculate the resource, uh, the utilization of the Blast TNG firmware, we can, it exceeds eight times uh, uh, for this chip, and we have eight digitizers. So instead of flying this gigantic Roach Motel, we could have just flown one of these we had the right firmware on it. And the power dissipation, which I'm a little nervous about. I should look at that spreadsheet again. Um, but, but yeah, if that's true, then yeah, this is the way to go. So, um, so onward. So I started thinking about um, more of a general firmware architecture. So what, um, what does it actually mean to read out frequency multiplex detectors? And I started getting inspiration from the digital communications field. So starting to think of it as a modem a modulator and demodulator information source, but really our information source would be from the sky. That's what we want to decode. But anyway, this is, this is a good uh, way to think about it, I think. And we can even use like uh, some of the performance metrics, like bit error rates or symbol error rates, and like calculate channel capacities and things of, for these multiplex detectors. So if we think about the modulation, so we're trying to send out this probe, this comb of frequencies, the probe tones, um, to bias the detectors, and there's multiple ways to do that. So you can use a lookup table, is how we currently do it in BLAST, or a quartic array, um, or uh, frequency chirping, which is an interesting thing that JPL is investigating, um, and uh, inverse fast Fourier transforms, polyphase filter banks, and then the sparse IFFT, which is also another interesting option, which I'd like to investigate. And then demodulation is almost the exact opposite. Um, but yeah, you can do complex digital down conversion as you would in a frequency shift keyed uh, modem or matched filter banks and then polyphase. Um, and then also if you're doing a single photon detection or pulse detection, maybe you want a high timing resolution circuit. Maybe you want a time to digital converter or something like that. All right, so yeah, onward. So we, um, yeah, we've been working with the RF SOC um, and we've gotten to the point now, we started with the QPSK uh, demo by the University of Strathclyde, and that was great. We learned a lot from that, and uh, then we started to build from the ground up instead of from the top down, and now we are here where we have the, the microprocessor system, the, digiti the digitizer. Um, we have, I designed like a parallel cortic, so I can run the PL at half the rate that, that, that the digitizer is running at. And then I'm trying to collect data into the DMA. Now, um, and then this is all controlled by like a simple uh, Python script in Jupyter Notebook. Um, so yeah, it is, it is very simple. You just yeah, <laughs> oh, up, upload the bitstream and you know, write to your custom IP. And you, know, you can do cool things like put little slider bars in there and watch this thing move around on the spectrum analyzer. Um, and I'm going to be posting this, uh, this, all of this work onto my GitHub so that we could all use it. Um, okay, and this is um, a cool circuit, which it would be awesome to hear of other uh, people at, at this conference. Um, tr try and talk to them and get some ideas for how to solve this. But um, we would also really like to be able to follow around these resonances. And so we've kind of devised this little PID loop where um, we want to always look, we want to look at the phase and we want to be, have the probe tone sitting on the maximum of the derivative of the phase with respect to frequency. And so um, this was one way of doing it. You calculate the phase, you filter it, you subtract from some reference uh, phase and then convert it to a frequency error and then you scale it. Um, and then, so it's, it is kind of like a PID. So um, 
this changes um, how you would actually do tone generation because if you want to update your frequency quickly, then um, a really large lookup table uh, like the QDR may not be the right choice. And so that's why a cortex, an array of cortex, or a, a polyphase filter bank might be the right choice. Okay, so yeah, future and uh, other work. So yeah, hopefully this um, RFSOC work will be used for um, the balloon-borne telescopes, exclaim TIM uh, and B4, and then um, maybe a MUMUX uh, TES experiment in the Himalayas of LACBT. Potentially, we could use it for that. Um, we've also been working with industry partner AlphaCore, uh, which is like local to Tempe, um, and on NIST SBIR for uh, 48 gigahertz. Um, up and down converter boards. So this is an example of the IF slice that we're using for Toltec. Um, and so we've tried to uh, put everything onto one board and we're still working on it, but it's, it's exciting to actually see the miniaturization of this. And um, now we're thinking about putting some of these on, on balloons and, um, and other experiments. So uh, actually Andrew Levy is here from AlphaCore, I think. Um, so, oh yeah, there he is, he's up here, so there you go. So yeah, talk to him if you want to know more about this up and down converter board. Okay, yeah, and thanks for listening. Can you go back one slide before I take a picture? Okay. Ah, okay. Um, so we have, yeah, I, I didn't put any of the optics in here. Um, but if we go back to the first slide here, we have the detectors. Here we go. Okay. So um, these are actually just uh, geometrically due to the design of the detector. Um, these are uh, polarization sensitive. This is the, the main um, absorber. So we have one that's kind of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, just due to the, the fact that we have these like orthogonally oriented, we have uh, polarization sensitive detectors. So only one detects one polarization and then one detects the other. And then um, we also have a half wave plate in, um, so we can rotate the, the, the polarization as well. Um, yep. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, maybe, I don't know. I would have to think about that. That's. Yeah. Sure. Just, the, just the general layout looks remarkably similar to the 3G CMB camera they have at the South Pole. Does each one of these have a little feed horn inside? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it, each one has a feed horn. It's um, yeah. So yeah, there's there's um, nice aluminum uh, like micro machines horns above each one. So uh, yeah, they're not antenna couple. They're lumped element and. Um, yeah. So. so do you effectively receive most of the power in the focal plane? Yeah. The feed horns cover it pretty much. Uh, okay, so yeah, the feed horn is, uh, I mean, the spot size uh, from the feed horn is slightly larger. There's a little bit of overlap on the capacitors, but but yeah, it's it's supposed to go cover the entire uh, circle here. So. And it, yeah, like five uh, millimeters or so. Yeah. Okay. We can take one more question. Okay, thank you very much for that interesting.